Hey guys, welcome back to Defending Arminianism Part 2. I'm your host, Lucas Curcio, and I'm with my brother, Dan Chapa, and we are going to talk about the death of Christ that is unlimited atonement. Now, if you didn't watch episode one, we recommend that you go ahead and do this. We did say, though, uh, you know, to make a caveat that we were going to talk about prevenient grace, but Dan pointed out how really that starts with the death of Christ. So we're actually going to talk in this episode about unlimited atonement. So we're going to give you the positive defense from the scriptures because the series Defending Arminianism is about giving the positive case, the scriptural case for the doctrines that are essential to what we call classical Arminianism. Arminianism. I have a hard time saying that uh, sometimes. <laughs> but Dan, uh, you know, good to be with you again. Yeah, likewise. Thank you for having me back, Lucas. And it's always good hanging out with you, um, getting a chance to talk about um, God's Word. And this is yeah, this, this series has been a blessing for me. Thanks for this opportunity. And, uh, you know, I um, I guess uh, the first one went well enough that I get to come back. So, yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's always good. Yeah, you're great. Yeah, yeah, you're a great teacher. And, you know, I got some good feedback, too, you know, from people on you as well. So, you know, I, uh, you know, I appreciate all, all, all the work that you put into, you know, these slides for us. So I'll, I'll pull them up, I'll let you lead, and uh, let's talk about, you know, really, you know, this is the good news, the good news that Jesus Christ died for everyone. So, you know, this is, you know, what we're really talking about is an essential part of the gospel. So I'm looking forward to this one. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so um, in terms of a roadmap for um, this presentation for this evening, um, I'll start with definitions, which is basically just going to be circling back to what we covered um, in the intro to Arminianism, that first presentation. Um, the portion of it that related to um, unlimited atonement. And this episode will be focused on unlimited atonement, the fact that Christ died for each and every person. Um, so after we go through those definitions, we'll take a deep dive on John 3.16, uh, which is obviously a very important text. And then we will switch gears and examine the case for limited atonement, the text and the arguments that are often brought up in favor of limited atonement. And then, time permitting, we'll go through a big pile of texts uh, in favor of unlimited atonement because, to me, it's the scripture is just replete everywhere uh, you turn. It's there. And then uh, we'll finally touch on the um, lesser important aspect, which is the historical considerations. Um, but, uh, you know, this isn't the first time anyone's discussed this issue. So um, that's what I had in mind. Perfect. So let's, let's dive right in. Um, Okay, so definitions. And once again, this was from the presentation on um, Arminianism broadly. So, and I just, this presentation hopefully will expand into that. So the first Great. point is the ex extent of the um, death of Christ, the scope, and or the provision. So Christ died for everyone. Christ's blood has the property such that it can save anyone and uh, will save anyone who believes. And if everyone believed, everyone would be justified by Christ's blood. And it's related to the offer of salvation because uh, Christ's death for someone is necessary to sincerely offer them salvation through Christ's blood. Um, the, the next term is sufficiency. So based on Christ's death, anyone can be saved. Sufficiency isn't just in the value of Christ's divinity, but in his provision through the cross. What Christ actually did and 33 AD on the cross is sufficient to save everyone. Then uh, in terms of God's justice, God's justice would be compromised if some sinner were saved apart from the cross. So the cross is the foundation of all um, salvation and otherwise there would be a justice issue on God's part. However, uh, Christ's death removed justice as an obstacle to salvation for everyone. Hmm. Then we have the intent. God does want everyone to believe and be saved, but his desire isn't absolute and at all cost. Um, how uh, so? But he, uh, he does, however, absolutely intend to save whoever believes. So God is om omnipotent, right? So if he wanted something, you know, and he's just going to use his omnipotence, and you know, and that's just what what happens. Um, but that's not the case. His desire sometimes has some things he desires more than other things. And uh, so his desire to save um, through the cross isn't absolute at, at all cost. Um, and then the conditionality is Christ's death doesn't intrinsically guarantee salvation for everyone that he died for. No one is justified by Christ's blood apart from faith. Um, Christ's death doesn't 
purchase faith for the elect alone, mm. and it isn't a sufficient cause of faith such that it secures its own application. Um, so that's that's usually getting it, that's getting into the way Calvinists argue for limited time yeah. from time to time. And then the last part is the application. Justification is the application of Christ's blood, and believers alone are justified by Christ's blood. So those are um, some definitions and hopefully launching on off points. And yeah, I would just say too, you know, you know, for the audience, when we talk about unlimited atonement, we're talking about who Christ died for, and we're not conflating that with who Christ's death is applied for. And it's important to notice that distinction and maintain it because this is, you know, the biblical doctrine that yes, Christ died for you, but we're not going down a Calvinist route where we conflate Christ's death with Christ's application. Just like the Passover, the lamb was slain, yet then the blood was put over the door. So it's the same thing. We're specifically starting out with the death of Christ, that is who Christ died for. And then we move into the application, but there's an order there, who did Christ died for? And we have to start there rather than just, you know, you know, again, making no distinction so that the, the application is the death when, when, or if we go that way, that's when we run into errors. If we maintain this distinction, which is biblical, as we'll argue and show you, this is the right way to do it. Right. Thank you. So, okay. So pr probably the primary reason why I hold to unlimited atonement is the universal language in scripture. So John 3, 14 through 19 says, uh, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light because their works were evil. So I want to spend quite a bit of time um, on one specific passage because we're not going to be able to dive deep into every text. Yeah. Um, but I, so I do want to uh, spend some time here. So when you talk about the lifting up of the serpent, this is obviously from Numbers uh, chapter 21. So everyone needed healing. Um, at least everyone that was bitten. And the serpent is lifted up uh, for people to be able to look at the serpent. It's for everyone to see. So the intent in the lifting up of the serpent is to heal, but this uh, th this healing, the desire, this intention isn't absolute, but rather on the condition that people look at the serpent. And in terms of the provision or the sufficiency for everybody, anyone any of the people that were bitten could look on the serpent and be healed by looking at the serpent and the healing is offered to everyone through looking right so it's a free offer and it's based on the sufficiency the fact that the the serpent uh, could heal everybody is the basis of the offer to everyone look and be healed and the looking doesn't kind of reduce the balance on the healing value of the serpent. So it's it's qualitative, not quantitative. So it's not something that um, is, is subject to a limitation from that standpoint. And those who look are healed. So it's efficient for those that believe. So that's the analogy that Christ gives um, from Moses is lifting up the serpent. Now, when we come to the universal language, we see that uh, the text says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So what is the gift of God to the world? It's that offer and that the gospel offer is universal. It's for everyone. And within the world, there's a subset of those who believe. And yes, they are the ones that benefit the most from that gospel offer. But the gospel offer is a benefit to everyone because without it, people would be without hope. Um, then when you have, then when you look at the next verse, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. What we have is that the extent includes unbelievers. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, 
Well, no one thought God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the elect, right? The, the, uh, the, the, the idea of, uh, of Christ's condemnation, so at the last judgment, he's going to judge everyone, and that includes unbelievers. But then you have the intent passage, which is the second part, in order that the world might be saved through him. So what's the purpose? Why was Christ sent to be lifted up? So that the world might be saved through him. Hmm. And, and then um, in verse 18, what we in, in 19, what we have is the world chopped <laughs> into two bits, right? So you have this gospel offer and you have believers and then you have unbelievers or light rejectors. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. So that's the left side. Those are the believers. Those are the ones in blue. They're not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already. And people fall into one of these two camps. They're either believers or they're unbelievers. But that splits the world into two the, the two halves. Is it because is that he blue is not for Democrat and red for Republican? Oh, no. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the donkey and the elephant. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's, That's true. Maybe I need to change the color. Yeah, yeah let's look at that. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah I, uh, I. Well, Jesus I died for both Democrat and Republican. Uh, yeah. He did. He did. Yes. Yes. He, he did. So, and then uh, in verse 19, and this is the judgment that light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light because their works are evil. So, Based on the fact that the world is being split in two, that there's light rejectors on unbelievers on the one hand, believers on the other hand, the word world to me just simply has to mean everybody, every single individual, because if everyone falls under one of those two categories. But people object. So let's go through some of the objections. So yeah. this is objection one. The word world doesn't mean everyone. And this argument is from um, John Owen, who um, is one of the more famous people uh, from the limited atonement side. So here's what he had to say on this topic. By the world, the word world, we understand the elect of God alone, though not considered in this place as such, but under such a notion as being true to them, serves for the further exaltation of God's love towards them, the, uh, these people, the elect, which is the end here designated. And this is, as they are poor, so the elect are poor, miserable, lost creatures in the world, of the world, scattered abroad in all places of the world, not tied to Jews or Greeks, but dispersed into any nation, kindred, and language under heaven. So once again, that's uh, the death of death and the death of Christ by John Owen. So, uh, you know, when you look at the word world in just a word study, it's used 187 times in the New Testament, not one of those means the elect, um, at least not without begging the question, unless you just assume, well, yeah, yeah. John 316 must mean the elect, so it's, you know, th that, that sort of thing. And I would and, just say, too, too um, I actually don't have a problem when the Calvinist says, well, it doesn't mean everybody head for head. I'll grant them that. Sometimes it actually doesn't. Like, the example, you know, it, uh, that shows this is, is Luke 2, where it says that Caesar taxed all the world. Obviously, the Roman Empire didn't know about China at that time, but, you know, what I always like to point out is just because it doesn't mean head for head, it doesn't only mean the elect, which is what they need to prove it to be to, for their case to stand. So never is word world used only to refer to Christians. And that's that's really the contention. It's not, oh, does it mean head for head every time? It's does it mean only the elect and at the exclusion of the non-elect? And you can never have that evidence, not once in scripture, either by context or by definition. That's exactly right. Now, sometimes it does mean everyone head for head. Yeah. Um, I mean, this, a lot of the lexicons just list inhabitants of the world or mankind as definitions. And then there's passages like Romans 3.19, that the world may come, become guilty before mm -hmm. God, or the world by wisdom knew not God from 1 Corinthians 1.21. Passages like that, yeah, that does mean each and every individual. Um, but what you'll never see is God. Uh, you know, God justified the world, God regenerated the world, God re elected the world. There's not expressions like that. Mm -hmm. But you would expect that there would be. If <laughs> if the word world just meant believers or the elect or something like that, why doesn't the Bible, you know, why couldn't the Bible say God elected the world? 
yeah. if the world yeah. just means believers. So, um, so, you know, I guess, but that's just from a lexical standpoint. Um, I think the, the bigger issue is you just can't read the text to mean the elect. It just doesn't fit. So let's say, um, let's, let's just cross out the word world and put the elect and see if this works. So as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the elect that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Okay, the problem there is that the whoever believes distributes the world. So it's a, remember that the, the circles where believers is a subcircle underneath the word world. But if you don't have that, if it's just the elect, then what you have is a duplication. For God so loved the elect that he gave his only son, that whoever of the elect um, um, believes, that doesn't work because you don't expect. The, the elect are going to believe. That's that's just part of the definition yeah. of them being elect. So you, it, it's, you can't have a subcategory underneath the word world grammatically that way. But the problems get bigger. So in verse 17, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the elect. Wait a minute. Who thought that? Who it just, thinks? It just doesn't work when you say it out loud, right? Like it, it really, you know, like sometimes like you really have to say these things out loud. It sounds ridiculous if, if you read it this way. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and then when you get down to 19, it gets, it, yeah, it gets, it gets out of the, you know, it gets wacky. This is the judgment that light came to the elect and the elect people love the darkness rather than the light. That's the exact reverse. Yeah. The exact, the exact <laughs> reverse of the attack. Yeah. So you, so it just can't, it can't mean the elect. Now, um, that said, I found a, an article uh, by a James Gibson recently, and it was an interesting read. So he makes a, he has a, a slightly maybe more developed case than Owen. So I figured we cover that a little bit. So what he has to say is the content of the world does not designate any particular reference, even though it is referring expressions. The reference of the world are underdetermined by the expression itself. And then later on, he clarifies a little bit more, not much more, but he clarifies a little more. Uh, even definite expressions, those containing the def definite article, which, by the way, John 3.16 does have a definitive article, definite mm -hmm. article. It is the world. It's not a world. Yeah. Or, yeah. But so it does. But so even those that have a definite article in their reference uh, can be indeterminate in the referent because they involve collective singular terms, the team. For example, the team was disappointed by losing the game, says something about a collection without saying something about any particular member of the collection. There is no contradiction in asserting that one member of the team was sad, even while expressing uh, sadness was true of the team in general. Um, okay, so in John 3.16, the word world can convey a mode of presentation without the mode of presentation, thereby designating any particular reference. Now, I disagree with his example on the team. And I think you just said it very, very well. So when you he talks about it as, as like a, uh, a general expression about the team. Okay, so when you have a general expression, there can be exceptions. So like Kansas is generally flat, right? Well, yeah, maybe there's some mountains somewhere, right? But Kansas is generally flat. Most of it, if you look at it on you know from a satellite, it's gonna look flat and most of it is, even though there's some exceptions. So um, the same is true of the team. If the team is generally sad, even if there's one individual, a couple exceptions, the team is generally sad, but that's not the same thing as that. There's no particular reference at all, right? <laughs> the, the general, so apply the same logic to the word world. Let's say the word world was a general reference. So, so the problem with that is, um, when you look at the population of believers or Christians in the world, let's say, and this is extreme, but let's say there's 1.6 billion Christians in the world out of 8 billion, right? The general picture isn't that the world is elect. 
That's the problem, right? It's the it's kind of the um, opposite, even though uh, you know, Christianity is very big. And that's even assuming that all nominal Christians, you know, like including Roman Catholics and Ethan Orsak, are they're all actually saved. So the the it's it's not true in general that the world is saved or the world that the, that the world is elect. So okay, now what about this notion of well the word world doesn't designate any particular reference? I'm not really That's yeah, but like, like I'm not um I don't really know what he means by this general by, by that term because it's so unnatural to even read it that way. Where it's like like you have to have an agenda to even offer that argument. Yeah. Okay. If I understand him, it's it, let me see if I can try to clarify the point. So there's he makes a distinction between basically the content and the referent. Re when you ref when you speak of something, the referent is the external object. So if I speak of my pen, this is the referent. Um, now, if I speak of my pen, let's say I have a mental image of a pen in my head, and it's a but but let's say I have an abstract concept because I've seen thousands of pens and I have an abstract idea in my my head. That could be the the content. And it's you know kind of the list of things that qualify as what a pen is without referencing any pens in a the actual existence. So I think that's the distinction that he's drawing on. You know um, what's interesting, Dan? Actually, um, the moral government theory argues like this. So they'll say is that Christ died for the people, but not individuals. Where it, you know kind of has this generalized term, but not this individual personal term. So again, so 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 they can say Christ died for you. But they won't go then further than that and say Christ, or, or I'm sorry, you know, they'll say Christ died for the world, but they won't go further than that and say Christ actually bore your sins. So, so this is actually in in some way or agreeing or closer to the moral government theory of the atonement. He probably, I don't even know if he's aware of that, but I recently Maybe. I, been studying yeah, I don't you know, know moral government. About it. Yeah. So, okay, I've I've read two works on moral, the moral government theory of the atonement. One was by the original one by Hugo Grotius, and to be honest. It's, I think that is penal substitution with an extra element and just kind of this different idea of justice rather than retributive justice. He's got this idea of um, public justice, like reformative justice, like like basically teaching and, and education and the public good. Um, but then there's another version of uh, more um, the the governmental atonement by John Miley, and his is different. And I think that might be a little closer to what you were talking about also. So I, you know, anyways, but for the moment, I, I, um, I don't, um, I, I'm going to, I'm just going to say, I don't know enough about it to comment too definitively. Yeah. So I'll, I'll leave that, leave that be. Okay. So let's talk about this. So now we're talking about Gibson's idea of the concept of the world um, in a, um, versus the reference, the, the actual individuals. So if, let's say, um, Gibson himself, if he thinks that he personally is included in the world, then there's something about the word world that relates to uh, Mr. Gibson. And there's something about Mr. Gibson that puts him in the category of the word world, right? So... Yep. You can't you can't kind of get away from that connection between reference if he thinks this passage applies to him at all. Now, maybe he would say, "Well, no, it doesn't apply to me at all because it doesn't. It just talks about humanity in the abstract, and, and without actually subsuming any individual persons at all." Maybe that's really what he meant. It sounded like what he meant. Maybe that's Which, actually what he meant. And that's how you know proponents of the governmental theory will, will argue as they as they say that you know christ didn't necessarily die for your sins per se like uh, it it maintains this weird distinction where it's like it's 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 a generalized and again it doesn't go beyond that so um mm. you know, i wonder how how he would respond to that i mean you know not to go down a rabbit trail <laughs> uh, no that's interesting i i need to read more about it um that's a good um yeah that's that's very interesting okay so now, if the word world is the is just the concept for humanity, well, humanity applies to the elected and non-elected alike. We're everybody, we're all humans. And 
if he's talking about the concept, apart from any application of the concept to any individual, then John 3.16 applies to no one. <laughs> but that's not going to work either. So if it's the concept of humanity, apart from any individual person at all, um, that doesn't work, work because um, whoever or, who, or whosoever divides or at least potentially divides the group of world up. It can't be that God so loved human nature that whatever human nature believes in him shall not perish because human nature doesn't believe. <laughs> People yeah. believe. Individuals believe. And so the world, the word world just does have reference because God loves people. And Christ died for people. He didn't die for abstract concepts. Yeah. He died for people. Um, yeah. So I, you know, I just don't agree with uh, with Gibson's arguments there. Yeah. Um, so one last uh, theory that's been put out by Calvinists. So this one is by um, A. W. Pink. Here's what he has to say. Um, and he suggests that the word world just basically means Gentiles. So he says, now, the first thing to note in connection with John 3.16 is that our Lord was speaking to Nicodemus, a man who believed that God's mercies were confined to his own nation. Christ there announced that God's love in giving his son has a larger object in view, that it flowed beyond the boundaries of Palestine, reaching out to regions beyond. In other words, this was Christ's announcement that God had a purpose of grace towards Gentiles as well as Jews. God's so love of the world then signifies God's love is intentional and in it's international in its scope. So for starters, that's not in the context stated. Now, you know, probably Nicodemus did have some of these ideas. But the problem is this. So as Calvinists, they still don't believe that Christ died for the Gentiles. So if you cross out the word world and put Gentiles, that's not going to work for Calvinists either because there's bunches of Gentiles that they think Christ didn't die for. So he, he didn't die for everybody that falls under the category of Gentiles. So what they must mean is, well, Christ died for some Gentiles, not all Gentiles, and which ones the elect. But we've already covered the idea that this doesn't mean the elect. and Or they could mean Christ died for the concept of Gentiles, but we've already covered that as well. So even though it just kind of moves things around a little bit, it doesn't ultimately get away with the the key issues that we've that we've and, discussed. And, and and also had too is you know when the Bible says Jew and Gentile, there's nobody else beyond that. So the Bible says that to say everyone. So Gentile means nation, Jew means the state of Israel. So we're talking about Israel and other nations. There's nobody else. So even if they want to go down that route, that's still admitting the same thing. Christ died for a Jew and Gentile, which is another way to say absolutely everyone. And Paul argues that way. He says both Jew and Gentile, when he refers to them being under the condemnation of the law, is that just only the elect Gentiles? No, it's absolutely everybody. And so, you know, really, if they want to go Jew and Gentile, I'm fine with that. That's just another way to say everybody because the Bible uses that to say everybody. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So now, objection two. Um, so and I should have made this bigger, but this is that's uh, James James White. So all the believing ones. So he he basically objects to the or took exception to the translation of whosoever or whoever. And so here's what he has to say. Um, this the literal translation right here is in order that everyone believing in him, all the believing ones. There is no indefinite relative there that that just simply throws it out there and says there can be no identification here of who it is that we're talking about. So he wants it to be this collective of all the believing ones, and he wants it in the sense of individual identification. Bob, Sue, Tim, Joe, these folks, but not those folks over there. Okay, so that's the idea that he's throwing out. And I got this off of one of his YouTube clips from AMN. I have the link there, but Great. Um, anyways. Okay, now, for starters, there's no translation that says all the believing ones as a collective. There's no translation that has that. And the word pass, which is used, is it has two um, multiple meanings, but two of the basic meanings are any 
or all. And any is distributive, all is collective. And it's the context that decides that. But um, lexicons like uh, yeah, BDAG uh, list John 3.16 under whoever, not under all. And Mounts argues that uh, whoever, if he, Mounts argues for the translation whoever in the uh, past plus ho plus the present participle construction because he says it's an indefinite construction. Um, but I'll give some examples that'll make that hopefully more concrete. But let's say for the sake of discussion that it's a group, um, a collective of all. Mm -hmm. The problem for James White's position there is, is even if it's in a group, it's not an immutable eternal group like the elect. It can't be. And here's why. Jesus is evangelizing. That's the purpose here. Now, you could say, well, John wrote to the 16, although 15, but 15 has the same issue. John 3, 15, which was definitely spoken by Jesus, has the same issue. So Jesus is evangelizing. What's his rhetorical purpose in saying this? It's to encourage Nicodemus to leave the group of unbelievers and join the group of believers. Now, imagine that the group unbelievers is an eternal, immutable group. <laughs> He can't. He can't leave it. You're if if Nicodemus is in the group of unbelievers and that group is immutable, you know, then he's stuck. You know, yeah. and he he can't leave it. So there's no there's no way that's the sense. So the offer of salvation through believing is for anyone based on God's love for everyone, and those who don't uh, believe get eternal life. Now, if you if you doubt that, I gave I have some examples of how this is used in different contests. So you have the pass ho construction, the same construction that's in John 3.16, but let's just look at it in some other context. It's used as warnings in different places. So in the same chapter, in John 3.20, he says, for everyone who does wicked things hates the light and doesn't come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. Okay, imagine that's an eternal immutable group. I've sinned before I was saved, of course, if that was eternal and immutable, then no one can ever be saved. Yeah. Now, now another time it's used as a warning is to, to Pilate. So the Jews come to Pilate during Christ's trial. Um, for then to Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you're not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. Right? All the ones who make. So. In, in that sense, for starters, the rhetorical purpose is very clear. They're warning Caesar, don't jo join the people who oppose King Caesar. Um, so it's it's pretty clear that that's a immutable, changeable group you can move into it um, or out of. Um, I could give more, uh, more, but, uh, more warnings, but hopefully that suffices. But in terms of, that's not the only other way that it's used. So let's take, for example, um, Matthew 5, 28, there's a, more, a universal moral principle that applies to everybody. Everyone is restricted in this sense. Whoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her in his heart. Okay, so who is being restricted? Everybody. That applies to any anybody and everybody. No one, it's, it's not moral to do that. For, for everybody uh, falls under that moral restriction. But those that actually do it, fall under the penalty. So the restriction applies to everybody, and then everyone who actually looks falls under the penalty. Well, that's the same way that John 3.16 works, right? The gospel is for everybody. The love of God is for everybody. And then those who actually believe the gospel get the benefit, eternal life. Um, and then, go ahead. Oh, oh yeah. uh, and so the, yeah, I was gonna mention, like, there's nothing in this text that is limiting any of this like the clear gist of the text is a universal offer love giving of christ and you could see this too even when christ references a serpent you know uh, in, in in the old testament that you know christ is going to be lifted up like that so so in the old testament when the serpent was lifted up everyone who looked on him was healed so christ is saying i'm the you know the serpent everybody who looks on me is going to be healed and so there's nothing limiting that and you can try these techniques, but then, you know, you know, going back to what you said, Dan, James White interpretation would, if you say it out loud, you can believe it, but, but say it out loud before you believe it. It sounds ridiculous. So James White would have you to say, 
for God so loved the 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 elect that the 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 believing elect would not perish but have eternal life. Like it it just sounds completely you know ridiculous, and it, and it's against the you know uh, the narrative of what Christ is communicating to an unbeliever, saying, "Hey, God did this. God lo- God God so loved the world. If you believe, you can be saved in me." And for James White and John Owen, you know, or Gibson, like whoever, to to try to flip the script on this, it just it really is just absurd. And, and again, say it out loud, and you can clearly see the absurdity. That's right. That's what, exactly right. Yeah. And so, right. The last bit is that the Paso construction just simply is used in invitations. It it's invitations to a broad group or everyone. Um, and then some people can accept her or not. So, you know, Christ used it in Luke 6, 20, uh, 47, whoever comes to me uh, and hears my saying and does them, I'll show you what he's like. And he goes on and gives a parable, but he's using it to encourage people to come and believe in him. Or um, Romans 10, uh, 11, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. That's the gospel invitation itself, right? In John eleven twenty six, and everyone who believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Christ is literally inviting her to believe, uh, right? So this is the, the, the rhetorically, this Paso construction just simply is used in warnings and in invitations. So it can't be this eternal immutable group, which means that the, you know, the all the believing ones argument um, essentially falls a falls apart it yeah, doesn't yeah, work because then you know what passage then would be offering mankind an invitation to the gospel if we go down this route you would then reduce everything like romans 10 whoever you know calls on the name of the lord shall be saved you now have that meaning as you said that immutable decree all the elect calling on the name of the lord will be saved well what do we do for evangelism then what do i give somebody where's the open invitation because calvinists will preach as if christ died for all men and he offers all men salvation but what verse then if we go down the james white route what verse we have nothing and you know this is how you know it, it's it's just it's faulty thank you yeah i appreciate it okay so okay switching gears now let's go to the other side what about limited atonement so um for starters what's not in scripture the bible never says christ died only for the elect the Bible never says Christ did not die for the reprobate. The Bible never says Christ purchased faith. Um, and there's other things, but you know, I think I think that's important to say. The, the fundamental tenets of limited atonement are not in scripture. They're just not there. Yeah, and and to be fair, you know, we're not arguing the Bible has to say s- certain things in these exact terms to be true. Like Dan and I both will agree through a systematic reading of scripture, the Bible can paint a concept and therefore it's biblical, like Trinity. Trinity is not said God three, God three in one, but systematically we know the Bible teaches this. So, you know, we're not saying, okay, the Bible doesn't say this and this exact words, therefore it's not true. Um, but, you, you know, what we're clearly trying to point out is that these principles, these concepts are simply just not taught. Right. Right. Okay. So now let's look at some of the arguments that are made in favor of um, particular redemption. So some, one of the arguments is particular language supports particular redemption. So um, Matthew 20, 28 says, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The problem is many can just mean all like it does in Daniel 12, 2 and Romans five fifteen. So Daniel 12, 2 says, and many of those who slept in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Well, that's everybody. The same is true in Romans 5.15. For if many died through one man's trespass, that one man's trespass is Adam. So when many died, that means everybody died. And that's just a Hebrewism. But, um, the, you know, we could look at other passages like, for example, Christ dying for the church in Ephesians 5, 24. Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself a savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit uh, in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, um, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by washing of the water with the word. 
so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot and wrinkle, or any such, that she might be holy and without blemish. So um, this relates to the application of Christ's blood to believers, because it's talking about uh, believers who are incorporated into Christ. Um, so I would say that this language itself actually excludes the elect themselves prior to faith. This doesn't apply to even the elect until they come to faith. Um, yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah, so that, that's, um, and then, then, of course, you have the negative inference fallacy, which I should spell it. So just because um, the Bible talks about um, Christ died for this person or this group doesn't mean he didn't die for others. And the and classic example for that too, actually. Um, yeah, go ahead. Well, you know, uh, real quick. So, you know, uh, the word many in Matthew, you know, twenty twenty eight. like if I had a million dollars and I said, you know, somebody asked me, Lucas, how much money do you, know, do you have? And I said a lot or I've or, or, or I have many hundred bills. I wouldn't be excluding what I actually have. So just because Christ says many, it's because there is there's a lot of people, right? It's many It's still a true statement. And you can see it just in Romans five for if many die through one man's trespass doesn't mean only some are affected by original sin and total depravity, you know, clearly uses it for all. And like you said too, like you know, when we read passages like Christ died for the, his his church and, and the sheep and and uh, you know the sheep, if 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 we were to apply that in life, that that would just be absurd. Like if I say I love my wife, you wouldn't interpret that. Oh, Lucas doesn't love his daughter. Lucas doesn't love his mom or his father because he said, look, you know, he loved his wife. When Paul says in Galatians two twenty that Christ died for me. You know, we don't now believe in limited, limited atonement, do we? Look, Paul said Christ died for me. He only died for Paul. So it, it, it's illogical to, to say because, you know, we have these statements in particular references to people, it therefore excludes others. When if we were to live that out um, in, in our own lives and even in verses like Gal Galatians 2.20, again, it would just be illogical and it would just be ridiculous. And so it's like, you know, can we clearly see, you know, the, you know, the Bible is using this, the same kind of language. And for us to go against that, that's to depart from the normal rules of hermeneutics. Right. Um, yeah, exactly. So uh, one further passage that's used in this regard is that um, Christ died for the sheep. So John um, 10, 11 through 12 says, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And so, again, you could have the negative inference fallacy there because, well, it doesn't mean he didn't die for the others. But um, setting that aside, there's a further issue uh, because in verse 12, it says, he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves and the sheep uh, leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. Now, the problem, and as everyone knows, this passage also has um, verses 26 to 29, where it says, no one can snatch my sheep out of my hand or my father's hand. So you have a contrast here be between the sheep and Christ's sheep, because some of the sheep get snatched. <laughs> so some sheep are unsnatchable, and some sheep get snatched. And... The background of this passage is very interesting. I would love if we don't have forever, so I'll, I'll try to make it short. Ezekiel 34 talks about the nation of Israel, and it talks about a shepherd, and it talks about the shepherds running away and being scattered, and it's talking about the leaders of the nation of Israel not protecting the people, especially doctrinally, but in other ways too. And then it goes on to the prophecy, that wonderful prophecy of my servant David will be a shepherd to the nation. And so it's a, it's a mess, messianic prophecy. So John 10 is the fulfillment of that prophecy. He is my shepherd uh, of David um, that, that has come. He is the good shepherd that isn't going to run away and is going to protect. And so now no one can snatch us out of his hand. The problem is in Ezekiel 34, it's very clear that the sheep is the nation of Israel, not the elect or believers or something like that. And the same seems to apply here because, you know, you have, I have other sheep that aren't in this fold in John 10. If so, if you, if you use Ezekiel 34 to guide the instruction, what you end up is with two distinctions between sheep. There's the sheep generally, and then those that enter through the door and those are the believers, and they're the ones that are Christ's sheep. So you have a distinction between 
Christ's sheep and the sheep generally, the sheep being the nation of Israel and Christ sheep being believers. Um, so anyways, um, okay, I shall carry on. Okay, next argument. This is an interesting one. 1 Peter 2, 24. Um, he, uh, who, who he, him, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> who his own self bore our sins in his body on the true tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye are healed. For ye were going uh, as sheep going astray, but now you have returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. So this text is written by the Apostle Peter, and he's writing it to believers. And you can tell just from the get-go on the epistle that that's what's going on. Mm -hmm. They have already been justified by faith. They're saved. They're not lost. They're saved. They have already had the benefits of the cross applied to them. So it's not surprising that they have application of Christ's blood language rather than just the provision on the cross. And the provision on the cross obviously happened in 33 AD. The application happens in time when people come to faith. So this is talking about the application, not just the provision. So the question here isn't, um, it, it, the question is, are they necessarily saved because of the cross? Or rather, are the application of the benefits conditional on faith? Now, the uh, bore our sins language is in the past tense. He bore our sins. And that 33 AD, that's in the past, obviously. Now, the intention can be spoken of in the past. So let's say, let's say that's talking about the application. But if the intention on the cross was so absolute, I'm going to apply my benefits to believers. If that's his absolute intention, then there's not going to be any exception. There's no believer that's not going to have his, uh, benefits applied. Then sometimes the New Testament uses this type of already but not yet language, mm -hmm. like in like in the golden chain. You know, those um, we're we're spoken of as if we're already glorified, even though we're not glorified yet. Um, but and there's many other places, especially in Ephesians 1, you've got that kind of language, the already not yet language, like we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus and that sort of thing. So I think that's what's going on there, but there's more to the story. And the first thing is the purpose of the sin bearing is moral reform. But that moral reform happens now and it's ongoing in the lives of believers. So just reading it again. So um, he bore our uh, our sins in his body on the tree. Why? That we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you are healed. For ye were going as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. So you got three things. You've got um, being dead to sin, living to righteousness, and returning to the shepherd. All those th three things happen in time. They're hopefully, you know, by the grace of God, they're happening in my life now. Uh, from a timeline standpoint, they did, they're not pegged to 33 AD. So, but we're still left with this puzzling question because, you know, Calvinists will still argue, well, did he bear our sins or not? If he bore them, they're gone, you know, that sort of thing. But that leads to an odd result of, well, what, you know, were we born justified? But we could go there. But to understand this, what we really need to understand is this concept of sin bearing. And we need some background from Leviticus to get our get it, get our a grip on this. So let's look at some of the Leviticus and Day of Atonement language, um, real quick. So the first question, and you know we're going to get to the double payment, but this is the double sin bearing, right? Yeah. So so what you have in Leviticus sounds like double sin bearing. <laughs> So in Leviticus 16, which is the text on the Day of Atonement, there's the two goats. The one goat is uh, killed as an offering. The other one is the Azazel, the sin bearer or the scapegoat. So here's what it says about the sin bearer. Um, and Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins. He shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall bear all their iniquities onto itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat go free into the wilderness. Okay, so 
by the same logic, he'd say, well, they're gone. All their sins are gone, right? And, the, you know, how could it happen? You know, how could something bad happen to them? You know, like how could they end up bearing their sins? It's yeah. already been gone. Double payment, double jeopardy, all this other stuff. Okay, now, you keep reading. Leviticus 19, 5 through 7 talks about what happens after the sacrifice is made because they have a feast. Okay, when you shall offer a, a sacrifice of peace offerings to the Lord, you shall offer it so that you may be accepted. It shall be eaten on the same day you offer it or on the day after and anything left over it until the third day. It shall be burned up with fire. So, you know, after a certain amount of time, you got to burn up the, uh, the carcass. Um, if it is eaten at all on the third day, it is tainted. It will not be accepted hmm. as an offering. And then, and everyone who eats it shall bear his iniquity because he has profaned what is holy to the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from the people. So what is going on here? How do we have a double sin bearing? If the goat carried their sins away, how is it that the person is still carrying their sins? And even in okay. the Old Testament, you know, when you have things like this too, you know, you know, the Jews clearly didn't think limited atonement. They were thinking that the sacrifices were being made for ev uh, everybody in that nation head for head. So even the, you know, like the Jews weren't Calvinists, you know, the Jews believed in unlimited atonement. Yes. Yes, that's right. So, and I, I think I might have it. Okay. Yeah. So, so the, it's the, the atonement the, in the old, old covenant is for the nation of Israel, but it has conditional benefits. So this is Leviticus, the same from Yom Kippur, from or Kippurim, the day of atonements, Leviticus 16, 33 through 34. He's to make an atonement for the priest and for all, all the people of the assembly. That's exactly what you were just saying, right? It's for the everybody head for head in the nation. This is to be a perpetual st uh, statute for you to make atonement for the Israelites for all their sins once a year. So the sacrifice is for the entire nation. Now, people had to assemble, right? On uh, 23, 27 through 30, we see the 10th day of the seventh month is the day of atonement, Yom Kippur. So it's related back to the Leviticus 16. Um, it is to be a holy assembly for you, and you must humble yourselves and present a gift to the Lord. You must not work on this particular day, because it is a day of atonement to make atonement for yourselves um, before the Lord your God. Indeed, any person who does not behave with humility on this particular day will be cut off from the people. As for any person who does not on this uh, who does any work on this particular day, I will exterminate that person from the midst of the people. So. Just be right. So they're they're not immune to being cut off, um, just because they were um, part of that ceremony. So there's a conditional benefit. And now, what I find probably most telling is the Leviticus 26 passage. So if you read the whole chapter of Leviticus 26, the entire focus is on the conditionality of the Old Testament covenant. So if you do, uh, if you break my covenant, I'm going to strike you and then if you break it again i'm going to hit you harder and then if you do it again i'm really going to nail you and then the last the the fourth warning is in 26 if in spite of this you do not obey me um but walk in hostility against me i will walk in hostile hostile rage against you and many other cursings including one specific curse, I will refuse to smell your soothing aromas. What is that talking about? It's talking about at Yom Kippur. After the sacrifice was made, they would take a portion of the meat and they would put it in the brazen altar. Um, they'd mix it with the, spice, the spices and then they would put it in the brazen altar and burn it up in the smoke and then the Lord would accept the offering, mm. right? So what is he saying? If he's not going to smell those aromas, he's not going to accept the offering. So it is, it's a conditional benefit. Um, so you, hopefully that clears up. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I was just going to ask, do you think verse 34, Dan, of, of Leviticus 16 should be translated to make atonement for the believing Israelites? Or should it be, <laughs> <laughs> or should it be the Israelites, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a uh, that's exactly that's great. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Right? I mean, if, if we're going to argue John three sixteen, which is John, you know Christ is is the you know the fulfillment of the Levitical priesthood, you know the sacrifice as well. Why don't we have verses like this being argued for Israelites as the believing Israelites or the elect Israelites? Only when we get to passages in the New Testament do they try to flip the script. So it's like in in, in the Old Testament, nobody kind of argues limited atonement. You can't argue limited atonement. It's it's just not there. Yet yeah, all of a sudden we get into the New Testament. Oh, surprise! That actually was you know the believing Israelites. That uh, that was actually only for the you know the specially unconditionally elected ones. It, it it's it's just it's not in the Old Testament, and we shouldn't expect it to be in the New Testament. And when we look in the New Testament, it's definitely not there again. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yep. All right. Okay. So now the double payment. Well, this is the same thing as double sin bearing, frankly. So, I mean, you might as well argue against the scripture itself, but the double payment um, is the idea of, well, if Christ paid the penalty for someone's sins, how is it that they're paying for it in hell? But the problem is it's, it's just at odds with the scriptural statements that the benefits of the atonement are conditional in faith, that we're justified by faith. Um, and basically if the Calvinist position was correct, then the elect would be born justified. But that's not what the Bible says. It yeah. says that we're by nature the children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Right? So the, the double payment goes too far. It just doesn't recognize any conditionality, and it undermines justification by faith because it basically implies that we would be born justified. And, and but, it can play its application with, um, you know, or, you know, redemption applied with redemption, uh, you know, accomplish. It's it's conflating the two. It's, it, you know, there's no distinction. Well, if that was the case, you know, as you said, Dan, you know, why are we, you know, why are we sinners, right? Like, why was I once a child of the wrath and now I'm no longer? Why was I once once a child of Satan and now I'm, you know, I'm a child of God? You know, the only way that could be possible is if there's a distinction between what Christ did for me and his death being applied for me. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Yes, yeah, so, and the scripture is just clear, Romans 5, 9, we're justified by Christ's blood. So justification just is the application uh, of Christ's blood. So there's the provision on the cross, and then there's the application at justification uh, when we come to faith and are justified. Now, let's but let's try to solve the, the riddle. Okay, so let's say you and I went to dinner together, and you know you could pay for my meal. So you can pay my financial debt. But what you can't do is pay my criminal debt. So if I murder someone, God forbid, you can't go to jail for me. You just can't. And even if you did, let's say they accidentally arrested you and you served 25 years, and then they found out, do you think I'm going to get off because you spent 25 years in jail? No. That's not the way that works. Mm -hmm. Now, how does it work? <laughs> Well, there can't be a transfer of a criminal debt except in one way. If we're united to Christ by faith, that's when the transfer can happen. That's when our debt can move to him. His right, you know, if, you, if you hold to the double imputation, his righteousness can move to us. But either way, the, the, the debt um, can move to Christ's books in a case like that. And that's the only, that's the only way you get to that double payment is if somebody who was united to Christ by faith and had their sin debt actually transferred to Christ at justified, if somebody is justified and then they end up in hell, yeah, then you've got a double payment. But that's, that's really the only way. And, so, and there are some Calvinists who, you know, who agree with us on unlimited atonement, you know, as well. Like this is a newer argument that, you know, even the John Owen argument, like that's more a, a Reformed Baptist argument. That's not the epitome. John Calvin never argued it. John Calvin never even argued limited atonement. You know, even some Calvinists won't even you know uh, agree with limited atonement. You know, often like you know, the, like this is seen as like the you know the crux to you know unlimited atonement. Really, you know, this is just one of the easier arguments you know to beat. Actually, yeah, and it's um, yeah, in terms of church history, yeah, it doesn't. It shows well. We'll get to, yeah. So I have a slide on that coming up, but um, right. but it it it's Beza basically the first one to really um, spread the view. Um, but yeah, you're right. It wasn't Calvin himself, and and you're right that there's bunches. I mean, I'd say um, at least hundreds, if not 
more of Calvinist theologians who disagree with limited atonement. Yeah. Uh, and they're four point Calvinists, so to speak. So um, D- David uh, Allen's got a huge book that goes through exactly that. And most of his arguments are from Calvinists mm. <laughs> arguing ag- against uh, limited atonement. Okay. Um, so just for the sake of time, I'm going to just jump through some of this. Okay. The unfulfilled desires, the, you know, the, the, so s- some people will say, well, if, if God's intention is to save people, then why doesn't it happen? You know, because he's omnipotent. Well, the issue is he's not using his omnipotence to accomplish everything that he wants to happen. Um, so God created us to enjoy him forever, right? That's that's the very purpose of his creation. I think that's in the Westminster Standards itself, right? So, um, but it doesn't happen. Some people end up lost. And God dis- uh, demonstrates his goodness, love and power and wisdom and creation. God hates sin, but, he, but sin still happens. Mm-hmm. Right. So is that yeah. an unfulfilled desire on God's part that causes a rupture in the, you know, Godhead and Trinity or whatever? No. Um, he just permits sin in order to test us. Um, and there's just bunches of passages of scripture like that. But, you know, I could go into to more details, but uh, um, just for the sake of time, I'll, I'll yep. just skip through it. But the idea of unfulfilled desires just doesn't fit the scriptural model of God hating sin, but sin still happens. Um. Okay, so Colossians tw- uh, 2.14 is another passage that's sometimes used for limited atonement. Here, I'll just start um, in verse 12. Um, ye are buried with him in baptism, wherein ye are also risen with him through faith, wrought by the operation of God, who has raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven all of your trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, that was contrary to us. He took it away, nailing it to his cross. And having despoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them, openly triumphing over them. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink in respect to holy days or new moons or Sabbath days, which are a shadow of of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Okay. So Calvinists will key on on this phrase um, that Christ blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that were against us. And they'll say, well, if that, uh, and, and he nailed it to his cross. So if that happened on the cross, well, if let's say our sin debt was nailed to the cross, then how is it that anyone dies and pays the penalty for their sin debt? So I think the part of the problem is what exactly does the handwriting of ordinances that against us mean? It's not quite clear. Just using the context of the Sabbath days, new moons, touch not, taste not, handle not, all that stuff there, that sounds like the ceremonial requirements of the law to me. So to me, that's the best explanation that um, it is true and not when we come to faith, but when Christ died, the ceremonial aspects of the law were done away with. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say for the sake of discussion, though, I'm wrong, that it means more than just the ceremonial aspects of the law. Well, even then, if, if it extends beyond the ceremonial requirements, then it's referring to the impossibility of obtaining eternal life by perfectly obeying the moral requirements of the law, right? That's against us for sure. The law is threatening and condemning, and the law isn't, I mean, unless people were perfect, which they're not, the law isn't a means of salvation. Rather, what's happening is now there's a new covenant, and believers now can be justified by faith, and they don't have to perfectly obey the law to be saved or to have eternal life. Um, so I think yeah, and you have the yeah. word faith, right? In verse 12 through faith. So even if they want to go down that route, as, it, as, as you know, that means that um, everything you have a condition attached to this, which is Paul says through faith. Yes. Yes. He says, he says uh, that we're through faith, what we're quickened together with him and having all of our trespasses forgiven. So, if the if you wanted to pin the language literally and figuratively to the cross, <laughs> um, nailing no nailed it to the cross. What's happening there? Or you know, what is the Calvinist position? Are they saying that we're regenerated and forgiven of our sins? Because that's the exact language: quickened together with Him and forgiven of our trespasses. But the but the that very verse says that that happens through faith, not 
through the cross. So, um, yeah, so I'll, I guess I'll leave the uh, Colossians 2.14 passage there. Um, okay, um, so for the sake of time, I'm just going to speed run a bunch of texts about unlimited atonement. For starters, there's the counter examples. So um, 2 Peter 2.1 says, um, but there were also false, false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, bringing upon themselves such destruction. The Lord bought them, even though they're false prophets that end up destroyed. Three pass, uh, three verses later, it says that they end up in hell. So there's, yeah, this, so this is a counter example. Now, it doesn't prove that Christ died for everybody by the same logic of a limited inference fallacy. But what it does show is a counter example to the definitive atonement, because the model of definitive atonement rests on the assumption that if Christ died for something, they're absolutely guaranteed to be saved. Um, and this just shows that that's wrong. You can yep. see similar counterexamples in Hebrews 10, 29. Um, this is talking about apostates of, uh, of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled on a set of, uh, son of God underfoot, counted, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. So you have apostates who, for whom, if Christ didn't die for them, I don't know what makes sense. It makes for them to say they counted the blood of the covenant by which they were sanctified mm -hmm. a common thing because there is no blood of the covenant for them if yeah. the limited at home is true. The next one, so Calvinists have a scruple about preaching the gospel to, let's say, a, a full congregation and saying Christ died for you. They don't want to say that. <laughs> Um, they, they will say, you know, if you believe Christ died for you or something like that. But that's not a scruple that, that Christ held. So he, uh, Christ is in the upper chamber. He's with all 12 apostles, including Judas. And this is what he says. And he took the bread. And when he gave it to them, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Right. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after he had eaten, saying this cup, uh, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant of my blood. Likewise, he also took the cup after the supper, saying this is the cup of the new covenant of my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. So the fact that Judas was right there, the fact that he ate the meal with them, he shared his the bread did not stop Christ from saying, my body is given for you, my blood is shed for you to the group. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't see how, why Calvinists have that scruple of not preaching that Christ died for you to a public group, just yeah. because there might be some non-elect people in the group. Exactly. Uh, okay. Um, John 12, uh, 46 through 48, we have the, the, I'm calling it a context sandwich, right? So I have come into, uh, into the world as light, um, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my word and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my world has a judge. The word that I spoken to him will judge him on the last day. Okay. So you've got on the, on the opening side, he came for light for the world. And in John 1, 9, we're told uh, Christ is the light that enlightens every man that comes into the world. So that's everybody. And then he pivots from, I didn't come to judge the world, but to save the world. And the people on the last day will have a judge. Well, who's the last judgment for? Everybody, and especially those that didn't accept. So the word world there has to mean each and every person. But then you have the intention that he came to save the world. Mm. That's that's the problem. So the, I don't see, you know, oh, well, anyways, uh, another passage. Uh, so these are two in combination in 1 Timothy 2, 4 through 6 and 4.10. 1 Timothy 2, 4 through 6 says, Paul says, uh, um, God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. So this save is soteriological. It's not biological salvation. It's uh, salvation from our sins. Now, you flip to two chapters later in 410. For to this end, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God, who is the savior of all men. Especially those believe, those who believe, 
the especially it's a superlative term in a special way christ is the savior of those who believe but he's the savior of all men so I this all that. men includes the non-elect so there's no yeah. way around this so if you take the two passages and just the flow of uh, first timothy and mm -hmm. you know what you have is so christ's death is coextensive with the all men we're supposed to pray for including the unbelievers who persecute the church it's coextensive for um, those whom God wills to be saved and to come to faith. It's coextensive with those who have one God. It's coextensive with those who can't get mediation anywhere else, right? You have God on one side and everyone else on the other side, and Christ is the mediator between God and men, right? So, you know, what are you saying? You can go through Buddha if you're non-elect, right? No, that, that's not the point. The point is that it's good, you know, God on one side and everyone that's not God on the other side. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that it's coextensive with those for whom Christ's nature uh, he took on. He became the man, Christ Jesus. It's coextensive those who are supposed to preach for, um, to be testified in due time. Um, and it's coextensive with the larger group of humanity that includes the subgroup of believers. So I don't, yeah, so these, these passages are fairly clear. Um, so the conditionality application, hopefully that's, um, actually we've already covered that, so I'll skip that for now. Yeah. Other passages. Yeah, he's the propitiation for our sins and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. Okay, that's super clear. And, you know, what you have is our sins. So that's John and his readers. John, you know, the Apostle John is who is he writing to? We're not quite sure. You know, I found an interesting view that uh, is, I guess some church fathers and some manuscripts says that it's to the Parthenians, which basically would have been to the Persian Empire. Whatever the case is, you got John and his readers, which is a, a large group of believers, not just believers generally. And then it's contrasted with uh, the sins of the whole world. Now, Calvinists will push back and say, well, he's the propitiation. Ah, that means that he covered our sins. But the propitiation there is a noun, not a verb. So it doesn't say he propitiates for our sins. It says that he is the propitiation. If you go to the preceding verse, what it says is, uh, if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And the idea is that Christ advocates based on his being the propitiation. The propitiation could be translated, and in some translations is translated as the atoning sacrifice. So based on his sacrifice, Christ advocates for believers. That's the idea. Um, and once you once you understand that, then you can look back in the previous chapter where it has a conditionality. If you walk in the light, um, you have fellowship with us, and the blood of Jesus Christ is cleansing you from all your sins, right? So there's a conditional aspect to the application of Christ's blood to the believers. So, um, okay, enough on that one. Matthew 22, 4. I have made my dinner ready. My oxen and my fat, uh, my f fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the marriage feast. How can this be? How can he say all things are ready if there's no meal on the table? <laughs> <laughs> right for the for the unbelief you know anyways um so i could i could go on so there's more text here um okay hebrews 2 9 and we see him for uh for a little while was made lower than the angels namely jesus crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of god he might taste death for everyone john 4 uh, 42 we know that this uh this indeed is the savior of the world john 6 51 I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the wor the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. Okay, now, <laughs> uh, this is taking, worth taking a moment. So the manna in the Old Testament, Christ is saying that he's the bread from heaven, right? So whether it came down as rain or it came up as dew, either way, the provision of the bread is general and across the board and available for everybody. And it's just there. And then... People can eat the bread, or they can decide not to eat the bread, but the bread is there. Well, we have the same idea with Christ giving his body for the world. The general, the provision is there for everyone. It's available for everyone, and it's just there. Yeah. Um, the next day, we saw Jesus coming uh, towards him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. Um, again, I would apply that to the sin bearer language that we saw in Leviticus. It is uh, application is um, conditional, um, like we saw in Leviticus language. Um, so we could go on. Uh, 
Second it's Corinthians really just tons and tons of verses that just consistently teach us Christ died for all. And you know, if you ever doubt it, just say it out loud. And it sounds ridiculous if you read it any other way. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's really it was it, it's really strange. I mean, it's it's to me it's it's super clear. Um, but okay, uh, all this is from God. Uh, God. Who through Christ uh, reconciled us to Himself and gave he gave us the ministry of reconciliation, so that He reconciled us to Himself, and but He gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That's the preaching of the gospel. That is in, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting the trespasses against them, and trusting us the message of res reconciliation. Notice how the provision of uh, Christ's death matches to the it's the basis of that message. You can't have a gospel it, like. Um, it, what is it that unbelievers are getting condemned for for rejecting? So if you're supposed to believe that Christ died for you, but he didn't die for you, you really shouldn't believe it. <laughs> Anyways. Yeah, there's no real offer, you know, and there's no real offer behind the gospel unless Christ died for you. And, and, and you know, what solidifies, you know, again, the offer, the invitation is the reality of Christ's death. There is no offer. There is no good news if Christ didn't die for you. Yes. Yeah. Um, I wish I had more time to unpack this. Well, okay, but I will, um, for the sake of time only, I'll move on. Um, other passages. So this one, tw John 12, we'll probably get into next episode. But what Christ says is, when I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. I'm sure that will fit under prevenient grace. Um, so will the next passage. So I guess we'll move on from there. Right. So the blame for rejecting. Um, if Christ doesn't offer his blood to everybody, then he can't blame them for not believing in his blood. So John 3, uh, 36 says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, but God's wrath remains on them. And 2 Thessalonians 2, um, 10 through 24 says, they perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. So, Part of what's being rejected, so for starters, part of what we're offered in the gospel is to believe in Christ's blood. That's what um, Romans 3 says, you know, that we're supposed to have faith in his blood. We're justified through faith in his blood. So part of what we're supposed to believe is in Christ's blood. And then if we believe in Christ's blood, then we're justified by Christ's blood. But if there is no blood for a person, how can they be required to believe in Christ's blood? That's like literally requiring them to believe a lie. Yeah. Because he is. didn't believe for them. Yeah. So like what are they rejecting? Know. They're rejecting nothing. And you know, then they'll yes. say, Oh, you know, Christ's death is sufficient for all. Well, Christ, it, listen, if Christ didn't die for you, there's no way for God to forgive you. There is no way. So, you know, this is, you know, like an empty statement to, you know, to say that. Yeah. Yeah, it absolutely is. Okay, um, let me stop you want to this go to the historical argument and then we'll wrap it up there. Yeah, absolutely. But I do need to switch. Okay, so, um, man, I'm going to really kick the bee's nest here. Um, so, <laughs> do it. But, but history is what it is. It, you know, I, um, so prior to Beza, the Theodore Beza, who was uh, uh, followed on from um, John Calvin at Geneva. Limited atonement actually came up twice in church history that we know. And as far as I can tell, it only came up twice. But it came up, there was a guy named Lucian, and he believed in limited atonement. Um, he's after Augustine. Augustine did not believe in limited atonement, just to be clear. But Lucian did advance some of Augustine's views to an extreme form, and it included limited atonement. And they held the Council of Arles at 472, and they responded to Lucian's views. And so what happened is they condemned certain propositions, but Lucian himself backed away. And um, But we, ha we have uh, what Lucian believed, what was condemned, and then what Lucian retracted um, when he um, stopped believing in limited atonement. But here's the propositions. I'll focus especially on uh, two of them, that a man who perished had not received the grace that he might be in the way of salvation. And then the the fourth one is the one I want to focus in on, of course, that Christ did not die for all, 
and does not will that all shall be saved. So limited atonement itself was condemned. Uh, but Lucian himself personally wasn't condemned because he retracted the view. Then in the 800s, Godshock um, also taught limited atonement. And there was a council then in uh, 853, the Council of Quisares. Quisari? I'm not sure how yeah, to pronounce it. Yeah, that's a weird it. way. Quizzy? <laughs> yeah, go with that. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, Gotchalk, that's a fun name to say, though. Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, so so these not, are two regional councils. You, you know, let's just be clear, you know, for the audience. So these are two regional councils in church history. So Arles, there was a man, Lucian, right, Dan? He can uh, he affirmed it, and, the, and Arles rejected that doctrine of limited atonement, correct? Yes, and then Lucian um, recanted his 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 view of limited atonement. Gotcha. So. And then Gottschalk, uh, you know, again, you know, same thing. Affirm limited atonement. You know, and their and their council said no. Christ died for you know for all. And between the, there, you know, there was no talk of limited atonement. So if this is such a pivotal doctrine that this is just a historical teaching. Well, you know, we should have had it in church history and said, you know, we see church history condemn it. Yes. So here's what the Council of Quisari affirmed. So in the Canon 4, that Christ suffered for all men, our Lord Jesus Christ, as there is no one has been or ever will be whose nature has not been assumed by him, by Christ. So there is no man has been or will be for whom he has not suffered, although not all are redeemed by the mystery of his passion. But that not all are redeemed by the mystery of his passion does not relate to the magnitude and abundance of its value, but to the uh, portion of those who are unbelieving and do not believe with the faith that operates through love. Because the cup of human salvation, which has been accomplished by our weakness and by God's power, indeed contains in itself what may benefit all, but if it is not drunk, it does not uh, provide healing. So, again, the the point is this came up twice and it didn't just it, it, people didn't just say oh you know oh that's um that's interesting Here, and what you got to realize this. too you know for the audience is that church history didn't start in the reformation church history does not start with john calvin and so if if something like this seems well you know how is this possible like, i never heard of this is because a lot of times you know the you know the people who push limited atonement they start they begin it in you know, the Reformation, and that was only 1,500 years later. So what happened before that? Well, nobody believed in this. Two councils, you know, condemned it. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, I mean, other than that, you have just vast silence on limited atonement. And the list of church fathers who taught unlimited atonement is basically the list of church fathers. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that, that's probably an overstatement, but the list is... It's so long. It's it's almost not worth compiling. It's basically everybody else. I mean, yeah, um, yeah. Was that the end of our slides? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, you, you know, uh, I do want to mention First John two too because you know one of the things you know you know we talked about was um, in the beginning you know more so you know say you know say it out loud um, you know the Calvinist position is that if Christ you know died died for only the elect you know when you say it out loud it sounds really ridiculous like First John two two where it says Christ died for our sins not for us only but also the sins of the whole world. If if you're not convinced of limited of unlimited atonement, well, say say limited atonement out loud. Christ died for ours, the elect sins, and not for the elects only, but also for the whole world of the elect. You know, it just gets ridiculous, ridiculous. You know, uh, you know, and just absurd, absurd. So you know, the clear testimony is that Christ died for all. We can have assurance of that, and you know, we have so many verses and verses you know saying the same narrative over and over again from Genesis to Revelation that Christ is the Lamb. That died for for everyone head head for head. This is a consistent and positive defense of Arminianism, which teaches unlimited atonement. Any uh, anything you know you want to add, Dan? Yeah. So the way John uses the word "world" is the evil system that opposes God. So, for example, in First John five nineteen, for we we know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Right. So if you just do a word study of First John. How is he using the word world? You'll see that it's not the elect. <laughs> right? It's it's the exact opposite. It's those that um uh, it's the um the, those that are lost. So um yeah, so right, it is it's special pleading um to the extreme to try to paint that as the elect. Perfect. Yeah. And this was episode two, and the setup to this will be Provenient Grace. So Provenient Grace flows. 
from the atonement of Christ dying for all men. So if you didn't watch episode one, watch episode one. This is episode two. Tune in next week for episode three. This is the mini series, Defending Arminianism, where we defend essential Arminian doctrines. I'm Lucas Curcio, and this is Brother Dan Chapa. And guys, please like, share, and, you know, and subscribe to Method Ministries while on YouTube, Apple, and Spotify. And until next time, we'll see you around. Take care and God bless.